You're watching Suck Professor. Hello, everybody. It's me, Hank. I'm joined by James. Rawr! Hey, James. <laughs> Hello. Rawr! Hank. Which is lion speak for call the police. I'm being held captive and they're stealing my babies. <laughs> <laughs> what's, well, what's the opposite of exotic? Oh, God. Jesus. Why did you start with the heaviest <laughs> question I've ever heard? Um, is it common or? Moat couture. Mm, yes. When yeah. you die in the moat. If you dine in a moat, that's the opposite of moat, haute couture. Oh. That's Kanye. Yeah. Because he, he lives the haute couture lifestyle. Mm -hmm. All right. Welcome to the channel, everybody. This is our show. Kind of, We're doing like a podcast just to talk about the Tiger King. As everybody who is uh, at home and quarantined, or, and if anybody's out there working out in the world, uh, man, you have our thanks and our gratitude for taking risks that the rest of us aren't. We're, but we're watching Tiger King, and everybody's talking about Tiger King on the internet. And uh, James has watched it. I watched it. Everybody's watching it. Our families are watching it. And uh, the world is captivated by this crazy story. This wild man and his and, and everybody is every all the men and all the women in it are completely ins insane. There's mm. like this this there was this magical realm. It's like they found footage from a different planet and made a really compelling four or five episode documentary for Netflix. Uh, kind of tragic. Lot really sad. You see a lot of kind of haunting things, but it comes in a package of haunting, meaning like they're they're abusing animals and they're. I mean, by the way, big spoilers, everybody. Big major spoilers here, mm -hmm. but you know they're being violent, <laughs> going after each other. The guy takes advantage of young runaways. That that kind of I found quite disturbing and weird. And mm -hmm. but it all comes with this packaging of like uh, lots of sprinkles. Comes with a lot of little fun bits like goofy characters and strange. Uh, piercings mm -hmm. tattoos all over the place a bunch of so the way they unfold the story too is actually really well done because you don't really quite see what one episode how one episode starts you don't really know how it's going to end right like they they, 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 they they do pepper some things early on like yeah and like i think the first episode of the second episode there's these brief cutaways of like brief phone conversations of joe exotic from jail uh -huh. we don't know why he's there or how long he's been there or if he's still there or yeah. when we're going to get to that part of the story but it does kind of foreshadow things to come Sure. Is it, yeah, I think it's more of a uh, not to be pedantic about your word choice, but it it's um is that a foreshadow? That's a, more of a flash, like a flash forward, or well, it's like I they mean, start with. Well, I mean, like they do, they do show him calling from jail and talk about the murder for hire. Like it's like the first moment of the first episode. Yeah, but they um, don't really dig into the immediate events that transpired no. that led to that until much later. Of course not. No, but they they do start with like the ending and then they rewind real far. Mm -hmm. I don't think it really in terms of, I mean, they do go back into people's like histories and their yeah. lives. So it does go back decades. But the overall story thrust, I think is like four or five years back. I don't think it's that mm -hmm. much of recent history or, you know, it's not like yeah. it 2004. Um, no, I mean, these people were filming him for documentary purposes before he went to jail. Yeah. So this was not an experience. I guess it wasn't an expected outcome at the time that they decided to sign on for this project. No, and so they, I, I wonder how it works. Like, did the uh, Joe Exotic Industries give up all that footage because I guess it belonged to him and gave it to the filmmakers, or yeah. I mean, did did they have to consent to that usage of that footage? I imagine so. Somehow. Well, we I mean we do learn through watching of the show that the the producer guy whose name I can't recall at the moment, Rick the guy, uh, the guy who wore the Rick big Kirkman. hat and everything. Yeah. We don't have anybody's was, names worked out. We'll remember our yeah. best, but yeah, the guy who who was doing the the documentary, the reality show, essentially. Yeah, like the on. Hollywood. Uh, he's produced and he's been a reporter and done like extreme sort of stunt right. reporting, but also like. So, um, yeah, so we know all guys. his footage was lost yeah. due to something that we might talk about in a little bit. But we do know that everything that he shot was his property. Yeah. And because he was signed on to this documentary, I have to assume that anything that was shot thereafter that he recovered, if anything, or anything he happened to have that wasn't lost as a result of the incident that occurred, yeah. he would have given to the documentary filmmakers to use. Correct. Yes. And we know some of it is conclusively from that because... We see him in the footage and we hear him talking about the things that are happening in the footage, like the setting up the throne and the, and the infamous throne intro shot. Yeah. Yeah. That throne. So, <laughs> well, <laughs> okay. So, but if I, mean, someone, I mean, I guess if someone hasn't seen the show, doesn't know what it's about. If you had to use like two sentences to describe Joe Exotic, what would you say? Oh my God. Um, 
this is still physically, not even personality wise. How would you well, describe him? He, if okay. he's in a crowd, you say, I want you to look for Joe Exotic. Here's his description. He's the guy with the platinum blonde mullet, the unfortunate piercings throughout his head, ears, and uh, one dangly one on the corner of his eye. Uh, temple, I guess you call that. Is it, and it looks like it's like stuck into like a little like growth or something. Like a skin tag or something. It yeah. looks like if a bird were to tug at it just a tiny bit, it would rip right out. Yeah, like some kind of Photoshop trick where you just drag the yeah. pixels or something like that. By the way, I'm drawing a tiger for everybody on screen that's watching this. It's I'm just going to rate stretch it to be the time that we talk. So we'll mm-hmm. see how that goes because it's going to take me longer to draw it than we're going to talk for, for sure. Yeah. But uh, anyway, I, I, don't, I'm, I still don't know how it's going to turn out. I'm only mm-hmm. about 40 minutes into drawing it at this point, <laughs> Jenkins. I'm doing it from complete memory. I don't have that. <laughs> I've just. I, what did you say? What? About 40 minutes into drawing it? Yeah. Sound the like, tiger. Sound like you said Jank. Oh, no. My old boss? Yeah. No, I, I wouldn't draw him. That's so, what <laughs> I, I missed that I word. used to work at the Young Turks in case anybody's wondering what we're talking about. Um, and, No, I'm, I, whatever, it does, I, but I'm drawing this tiger completely from memory. I, I decided not to spoil my, my, my artistic vision with a actual photo mm-hmm. in my head of what a tiger looks like. So who knows? Side point. Um, that's a side point. Yeah. So platinum blonde hair, crazy, horrible piercings. Um, I think he's got his under eye makeup tattooed. I was wondering it about that too. Like it's it always was, there, even yeah. in like mug shots. It's there. What do they call that? Uh, the <laughs> mascara, sure, right? I, or something like people yeah. draw. I can't believe that the world has trained people to like take pencils and draw shit around their eyes. It's so fucking weird. Yeah. I can barely put eye drops in. Mm-hmm. You know, I have a hard time brushing my teeth. I get to get the toothbrush stuck in my ear. No, I was going to say eye. In, in my armpit, my eye, I poke out my eye. Um, he, he's distinctive. Oh, he'll have a gun on him and a big belt. He's kind of a, I would notice the guy out in the yeah. world. I'd be like, there's something, I would think there's something wrong with him. I'd be like, he's probably got, looks like he's managed his mental illness in a very specific way yeah which is a generic statement but that's how i would look at him okay but and not like, I, would, I would be threatened by the gun i don't know if i'd want to be anywhere near i'm not, not a fan of being around guns grew up with guns by the way and know guns pretty well so go ahead what oh. do you think well or i mean yeah say? no uh, yeah he, he he has a brace on his leg from an auto accident he had a while ago yeah he always appears to be packing heat on his belt Mm-hmm. He has the he dresses typically like a cowboy, cowboy hat, big tassel jackets. Yeah, usually a jacket with no shirt underneath, open right. all the way, so you can see his tattoos and his bullet hole yeah, tattoos and things. He's flamboyant, and his clothes yes. reflect that. Although sometimes they're pretty under, or you know, by his standards, they're understated, I guess. But yeah, he wears like big, shiny, kind of sparkly stuff. Right. He's gay too, which is like a really interesting um aspect of the show and the story because he uh has like husbands and turns out to be more than one <laughs> right and he has like this uh, sort of like nasally high-pitched voice but he's also a country music singer but when he sings his voice comes across completely differently it's sort of like this michael jackson effect where his talking voice and his singing voice aren't synonymous yeah Right, it's probably auto tuned and stuff. I'm sure. Well, uh, I, I did. I actually listened to a lot of his. Uh, I'm not a country music fan, but I listened to it because the guy is so he, fascinating. He just like exotic things. Yeah, and he yeah. does. Yes, he he does auto tune himself from time to time, but the majority of it is not auto tuned. Oh, okay. And right. if that's true, then the guy actually can somewhat sing. Yeah. So yeah. I won't put that past him. Can but. you? You should sing. You want to sing some country lyrics? Uh, no. <laughs> Riding my tiger down to the store, <laughs> yeah. pick up some tiger food. Now I have a sore. Yeah, because the tiger bit him, and yeah. now he has a sore. He has some talent. So I mean, it's not my cup of tea, but it's talent nonetheless. Sure. Well, I, I would say his number one talent is follow through. Like, I get all sorts of crazy ideas, and I have a little bit of follow through where I go, mm-hmm. I will actually execute my ideas. He will do. It sounds like he just does them all. I mean, I imagine there's things he chooses not to, but like he he actually like built built up this park. You know, he's not like a lot of people who have disordered cognitive or mental issues, uh, emotional issues, maybe Mm -hmm. Um, generally don't. I don't mean this to sound bad, but they don't usually see projects through completely Mm -hmm. all the way. It's just sort of a, you know, you kind of give up on stuff a little maybe. maybe. And everybody's like that, too. It's not just people with emotional disorders, Um, but like he is a go getter. (laughs) Because right. he goes and gets tigers, he goes and gets young men, he goes and gets drugs for his young men. He's kind of, and so the, 
the episode one, not that we need to go beat by beat, but we sort of were introduced to him and his world of tiger shows. So I guess there's a whole network and you see it a little bit around the country. If you've driven around America, I grew up in the Midwest driving around. I've driven across the country four or five times, meaning like Seattle, Chicago, LA, Seattle, mm. or uh, Chicago to LA three or four times. I, I haven't been out East as much, but you see signs for like weird little shows and stuff. Yeah. And you just kind of, they just fade into the background of the country. And in mm. this, this is like one of those, you'd see signs, probably billboards of some oh, weird, yeah. weird dude with a, like, with a tiger in some kind of strange outfit. Yeah. And it, you might be attracted to that because you'd say, wow, look, there, there's a tiger zoo somewhere. Let's go check it out. And they haven't, I mean, it sounds like they make a lot of money. It, yeah. it costs them three, uh, they say $3,000 to feed the tigers per day. Right. No, not per day, per, uh, per month. Per I think it was. No, it was per, but the, well, the filmmaker did the quick math and it was close to a million dollars a year. Right, because if it's like three thousand dollars per tiger per month. Oh yeah, per tiger per, and he has two hundred and thirty tigers. Oh, it was two hundred thirty because I was looking. Yeah. I guess well, the video I watched was older because at the time he had one hundred and seventy eight. Yeah, he ups it as time goes on. He's breeding cubs. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, yeah. So he's just gaining tigers at a rapid clip. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Anyway, getting a little disordered here with our. But maybe we should kind of talk about the overarching story, what it is. So you have this Joe Exotic guy who has a zoo, and yeah. he started the zoo in like 1996 or something like that. And it seemed like back in the old footage there, he genuinely had a care or concern for big cats and mm-hmm. a love for conservation and so forth. Whatever happened to him over the years that turned him into like that meme I showed you, like a the Mountain Dew genie. There's yeah. a picture of him saying, this is the genie that summons when you rub a two liter of Mountain Dew. Yeah. And he looks like that. He looks like a Reno 911 character that's a magician. Right. And he did do magician stuff. Yeah, of course, so it, of course he did. Before the zoo thing, he was a magician, and but then he introduced animals into his act, and then yeah. he said he used it as like I mean, this is all early footage to tell kids not to do drugs, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> he's like, I can't get kids to pay attention, so I <laughs> took them and get the zoo. get that's why I brought bring animals into the zoo. It's like he's and right on, here onto them onto the That's I could tell him don't do drugs. Just say no. Don't do um, them. Save them from me. That impression was way better than I expected. I wasn't was, planning on doing it. Nor, nor have good. I practiced. If I think about it, I get, I, I'm worse. So. Right. So, so we find out what he does, what he raises tigers. He yeah. has this whole conservation zoo. Uh, it's not really conservation because he charges people to come and pet the tigers. It doesn't look all that safe. Doesn't look, doesn't look like the tigers having a great time. But all, at the same time, it doesn't look like they're being overtly abused. It's just not a great situation for that many tigers in that small place. But as you learn to know who he is, you learn to know the different network of people around the country who do the same thing that he does because they're all connected because they need tigers. He breeds tigers. He sells tigers. He drives across state borders and gives them. And this is back during a time when there wasn't a lot of um, regulation and stuff like, like there is now. You couldn't just openly breed tigers and keep them as pets without permits. And Well, after that, Big shooting that where there was a guy, I think that was Ohio too, mm-hmm. but uh, someone in rural Ohio, Pennsylvania. You that's um, I remember when that was in the news like three or four years ago. Yeah, he let all his animals go and he had like a few bears, he had mostly tigers, a couple of lions. Um, I think there was some baboons, and the cops yeah. had to chase down all these wild animals and shoot them. Yeah, up. and they shot a bunch at the at the facility because I imagine they didn't all, but they were had to run around. I mean, talk mm-hmm. about a hunting, talk about an intense day. Yeah. For those cops and for everybody in that community but that changed some of the laws right. although i still think i don't think they've clamped down on tiger not entirely no, no. there's and as they say twice i mean i think they say it at the end and they also mentioned a stat at the beginning there's five to ten thousand tigers in the united states well uh, yeah five and, to ten thousand there's, there's roughly activity. four thousand in the wild yeah, that's... so there's way more tigers, <laughs> potentially double, but like mm-hmm. a lot of tigers live in this country in big ca- and people keep yeah. them as pets and sort of luxury. Speaking of haute couture, mm-hmm. um, they uh, I guess they're a status symbol for dumbass rich people yeah. that think they should have a tiger, or or people make a mistake and think they want to get a baby, and the cubs are real cute. Yeah, not knowing that they yeah. they grow yeah. to the point where they can eat you within like six months or less. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, um, continuing with your th- your mm-hmm. vein there uh the overall story oh yeah and how he has connections with other zoos and other exhibitors and what their kind of setups are whether are they more or less legitimate than joe exotic the answer is no they're not right but it introduces this network of essential friends like joe exotic doc antle antle was it antle 
yeah. Doc Antle, Joe Exotic, and some other cast of characters who are into similar lines of work, who have worked with them over the years. And we see all these old pictures of them interacting when they were much younger and so forth. Yeah. But then that kind of introduces the antagonist of the entire story. Not to say that she's the only antagonist. Everyone in this whole thing is an antagonist because they're all terrible people. But this is the one person who is a big... She doesn't work for it with PETA, but she kind of has her... She's in line with them. She has her own smaller zoo, her own smaller group of tigers. But her name is Carol Baskin. Mm -hmm. And Joe Exotic hates her with a passion that I have not yet experienced in a human being. He has devoted years of his life and money and time to exhibiting on a daily basis how much his hatred of her festers every single year that passes. Against Carol Baskin, which yes. he expresses through his many like, uh, and this is part of the follow through thing I was referring to. He has like uh, a TV show. I don't think it was actually yeah. a TV. It was some internet streaming show, but he called it a TV show. He probably mm-hmm. believed he was on TV um, and YouTube presence. And mm-hmm. I mean, they made country music videos and all sorts of stuff. And you, you'd spend a lot of time checking it out today. Oh, but, yeah. but in that, as you see in the documentary, he hates Carol Baskin. That Why? fucking bitch, Carol Baskin, Carol Why, Baskin, though? Carol Baskin. Well, she... Okay, that's partially what is um, misleading about her is that, and it's not necessarily that the documentary, the, the, sorry, that the filmmakers were deliberately doing this, but they, she's sort of presented as a activist who is trying to stop cub petting, which is a practice where you you take the cubs from their mother as soon as they're born, and then you just use the cubs as photo props or allowing children and families to touch them while they're young, and people go nuts for being with baby tigers but the, but then they grow into like they they age out of their profitability very quickly mm-hmm. like at like what do they say six months yeah, yeah about six months they can bite your finger off yeah and um that's why you should only get pets that you can beat up just a good rule of thumb yeah. that's why i have fish and uh because i can drown them oh wait that's cats mm-hmm. okay i got dark but um the uh Oh, so Carol, it, like she lobbies Congress, like she and she presents herself as as a outsider to the immoral practices going on in the in the big cat mm-hmm. collecting and displaying community. But as you kind of figure out, she's just one of them. She's doing it. She's doing I mean, and, and they they sort of offer uh, different sides of the different perspectives on these on these different stories as they progress through it all. And so. You know, as they point out, like it, they kind of start out with her seeming like the one who's doing God's work, so to speak, trying to trying to save animals and take take them into her park because they're domesticated. So, or you know, they're 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 not really domesticated, but they can't put them out in the wild. Yeah, and um, as a place to live out their final years. But she also brings in crowds that pay to come see the animals. Right, She's- and she uses volunteers. So I thought that was. I was really more curious, but this it sounds like they have tons and tons of volunteers. So her labor costs are very, very low because yeah. she uses this volunteering, almost like intern ranking system, like where people and the mostly women, it seemed like we're like, wow, oh, it's I, and then t- and in three years you get a different color T-shirt and you get to graduate yeah. to this type. It's like, wow. I mean, Every uh, other, than, other than actually managing the animals like hands, like being close next to them. Do you really need a lot of training to carry around big hunks of meat and do some like grounds work, groundskeeping yeah. work and like, you know, work on metal fencing and shit yeah. like that? It's like everyone who's involved in this at a, at a level of leadership, like the, the Doc Antles and the Joe Exotics and the Carol Baskins, they are all possessing the same cult leadership that allows people to gravitate around them yeah. simply due to the allure of exotic animals and petting tigers. Something about that makes people take their rationality and set it aside and follow these people blindly and yeah. do immense amounts of physical labor for them free of charge. And it, it's really interesting from a societal standpoint, like yeah. understanding what kind of power these people have over others. Yes, it's kind of culty. Uh, it's incredibly culty. There's, um, <laughs> I don't use this term as a, as with a, a positive connotation or a negative one, but some people are charismatic mm-hmm. in a way where they have a, a, a very powerful confidence that is somewhat something is seductive about confidence mm-hmm. and something is seductive about um, 
selfishness too, which is sort of what you get with narcissism. I think mm-hmm. it's part of how the Trump cult works, where people are drawn to his confidence and his in his in his uh, selfishness, yeah. and it sort of can in certain culty situations take over your own priorities or your own instinctive needs and you sort of attach into the leader's experience. And I think that's mm-hmm. largely not, not everybody's susceptible to that, of course, and it's different characteristics for different people. But um, for some reason, the big cat community, especially the people they feature in this show, in this documentary uh, have something like that. Yeah. And, and for Trump, sure. you know, Trump's got, you know, the charisma plus he's orange. <laughs> yeah. The big strike. <laughs> plus he's orange. Um, yeah, it's it's weird. And so Carol gets people involved who are wanting to rescue the animals and be part of like the solution, although they're still just amassing animals and making money off of so displaying the animals. Uh, Doc Antle is a guy who um, has a similar operation to Joe's, maybe a little bit more like corporate, a little bit more formalized. Much, I mean, much more. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And much, he much. he breeds and works with um, films and shows where you see tigers and stuff. So they show like a montage of movies that had tigers in them. Yeah. I used to um, see him on Jay Leno late at night. He was one of the animal guys yeah. that would come on. So I right. recognized him from something and I've later found out that's why I recognized him. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. And he wears kind of like a crocodile Dundee outfit, but yeah. so, okay. <laughs> All right. So the first episode sets up this premise that Carol and, and, What's his face? Carol and Joe Exotic are like mortal enemies, basically. Right. He really hates her and she's a big thorn in his side and she hates him too. Um, and then they get into, I don't remember which episode, so these are probably going to... The second know. episode was all about Carol Baskin's backstory. Okay. Was that about the husband? Yeah. Okay. So he, he Joe Exotic suggests that she killed her first husband. Was he your first, one of her first husbands? Did her second two, husband. He was her second one? Yeah. She had what, another one before the guy? Yeah, he met her when she was running away from a domestic dispute with her first husband. Yeah. And he convinced her to get into the car, even though he was already married as oh, well. Yeah. He was like 30 years older than she was. Yeah, that's right. He and was really And went and slept rich. with her at a was, cheap hotel. He was wealthy. She was like 19. 20. Okay, 20. <laughs> and walking along the road at night. That's right. That's how they met. And yep. Then, he, she first refused to get in and they came back and offered her. He came back like three times. And on the third trip, he pointed to a gun, loaded gun and said, if you don't trust me, you can hold this gun on me. I just want someone to talk to. Yeah. Which I'm going to try. I think I'm going to go to the bar mm-hmm. and uh, go up to women and, and um, be rejected three times. No, two times. Come back with a gun, <laughs> put it in front of them and say, you can point the gun at me if we could talk and then we'll get mm-hmm. married. And then I, w- and then she will, um, kill me <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so what the whole thing with this guy is that he was independently wealthy the husband yes. Carol, carol's guy no one really knew how much money he had but the people who were close to him his attorneys his friends gave estimates anywhere between five million and ten million okay it was, no one really the, the fact is people knew he had a lot of money but he didn't flaunt it. He didn't wear fancy clothes. He always had his jeans and a t-shirt on. He was into the business side of big cats. He wasn't so much uh, an animal freak as he was, how can I use these to further my financial gains? He was a, apparently a brilliant businessman. His family said that everything he touched turned to profitability. Yeah. And he would always go down to Costa Rica and come back and forth. He had his own fleet of small planes, even though he had no pilot's license. He had a fleet or just one? Plane? He had like two or three of them. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Both they were small planes that couldn't get down to Costa Rica without four refuels, but oh, you know, yeah. all that kind of stuff. So the thing about him is that he was also already married. He had kids. He was and like he, 30 years older than she was. Yeah, and he eventually ended up leaving his wife for this um, new woman who comes on the scene. 20-year-old uh, Carol Baskin, yeah. Right, and, and I think it was something like her daughter, his daughter was speaking and said that I didn't really like this because I, I think it was the daughter that said that the woman he was leaving her mother for was only one year older than she was. Yeah. It's like marrying one of your daughter's friends. Yeah. Which yeah. is just really, really creepy. But I mean, yeah. this, this guy, Don Lewis, that's what he wanted and that's All what right. he did. And the rest is history. But what really happens is that Carol Baskins gets to the point where it seems like she is enjoying his money and wants it to herself. Right. Now they opened a, the, the big the big cat rescue that's right. the name of their business yeah yet. Or, or had that been that was already running or it was um, like she after he she, got out of the scene he was already buying and breeding big cats for profit she okay. didn't want to breed them she wanted them as pets 
So they were at an an odds of that. She was saying things like, oh, I was spaying and neutering them as fast as I could whenever he'd go down to Costa Rica because all he wanted to do was breed them. He was all into the business. I was all into the love. Mm -hmm. And she only exclusively dresses in like head to toe leopard cat prints and stripes. So she's a wacko. Well, no, it makes sense because she's that's camouflage for her coworkers. Yes. That's why Jane Strip wears uh, flesh colored human suits that from different angles look like naked people. (laughs) James is a very strange man. It's a, it's a leotard. He's like a Cirque du Soleil character, but from from an M.C. Escher drawing. Human camouflage. <laughs> so you blend in with your coworkers, who are also naked. Yeah. <laughs> James doesn't breed them, though. James just wants to keep them so he can take pictures with them. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah. All right. So this is the second episode. And there's a big mystery here about a sudden disappearance. So the guy goes missing. In, and he just stops. Just, I think just missing. I was thinking about missing. Like, if I... Just drove off and never told anybody where I would go. You would notice eventually. Yeah. Uh, but when do you, when does someone become missing? It really depends on what when you is... get reported missing. Basically, yeah, I guess so. I don't know why I'm thinking it, like it's like it's complicated. I mean, but... Missing is a construct where a person can never be missing to themselves. Yeah. It's always when are they missing to someone else? Right. And and at a certain point. You involve the authorities. You yeah. make it an official missing persons report. And it took them, in this case, it's, two weeks. It's just funny that we're an animal where humans are this massive uh, cluster of animals that have taken over the whole planet. And every once in a while, one of us is like, we should write down that we can't find our friend. <laughs> You're yeah. like, my husband is not around here, so I'm going to go tell another person and they'll write it down. Yeah. And that's about all we can do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we'll just kind of make it a formal... I, I don't know. I've... Human behavior is very weird if you sort of just like make yeah. it real sterile. But so, and because missing is a suspicious thing. To, to right. Someone's missing. It's like, well, either where were they? What were they doing? Is it like, are they known to leave? Like tell, you know, so then you have to investigate. It's an interesting thing, missing persons. Yep. And, and imagine in America or in not just America, but all over the world, people get kidnapped. Young women mm-hmm. often get kidnapped more than I think we find out about. Um and, Princess um, Peach gets kidnapped every single time. Princess Peach gets kidnapped. Yeah, Donkey, she's Donkey Kong. Yeah. He uh, not a gentleman either. No, Mr. Kong. Um, so and actually, his name is not Donkey Kong. It's Don Key Kong. Don mm. Key Kong. <laughs> I like that. Really, I regretted saying it as soon as I started. Oh, it's pretty. It's pretty uh, good. So anyway, just the, the the notion of a missing person is right. So what what makes it weird though? In in the weeks well, prior. Oh, I don't remember. You so don't tell me. he goes to his friends, Don Lewis, and he's talking differently than he normally speaks. He says that he's afraid of his wife. He's afraid that she is going to kill him and that his life is in danger. He goes and gets a restraining order against her, which is odd out of character for him. His friends say because he hates the police and would never involve them in something unless he absolutely oh, yeah. had to. Uh, and he gave his personal secretary a letter and said, if anything happens to me, open this and it turns out to be a copy of the restraining order and a deposition of all the things that she has said to him and why he feel felt threatened and didn't want to be anywhere near her. So wow. there, they also talk about her have her being Carol Baskins or Carol Lewis, as she would have been at the time, I guess, because his name was Don it, Lewis. It's short for Baskin Robbins. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that she had changed his wills, given him herself power of attorney and rewrote his last will and testament or something like that to say in the event of my untimely death or disappearance. Stop it. I'm going to just turn my volume down. Yeah, turn that volume down. There you go. Yeah, in, in the unlikely event of my death or disappearance, which is unlikely terms for a will, according to at least one attorney who's Don Lewis's attorney. Yeah. Uh, then everything goes to her essentially. And, and then magically not long thereafter, all these things happen. He just, up and poofs and disappears. Yeah. Just doesn't show up. And she she kind of plays... She's got a real kind of cold iciness uh, to her. She doesn't... But she plays it real cold and icy, though. She doesn't seem to be emoting much about her missing... I mean, granted, this is 30 years later or mm-hmm. however many years later. It took a long time. But she's kind of matter of fact about... Uh, this missing story and she's like yeah he was just not there and, and I, I he went probably I, he went to Costa Rica I think she oh then his van was found near the airport right. or something right there's something know. about what she said though that that caught me off guard and they didn't really touch on it in the documentary and and that is they show her in a video interview talking to the police around like 1996 97 when this happened and she says to the cop or to the reporter, the last thing my husband said to me was, I will be leaving early, early, early. 
Oh, yeah. And then, without being prompted by that footage from all those years ago, the documentary guy says, well, when was the last time we saw your husband? And she looks at the camera and says, uh, it was, he called me and said he was going to be leaving. And I remember this early, early, early. Yeah. So that tells me that she's run this story in her head so many times that she's got it down all these years later. Yeah. It, 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 she did say it verbatim. I... The way she said it, I agree with you. But just because someone repeats exactly the same, obviously it's not enough to convict or anything. But like I agree, though. It did feel rote. Like It did yeah. feel like it was kind of just a, a memorized sort of thing, and she just loaded up the file yeah. in that moment. Um, but you could also see them. Like, I could, it wouldn't be weird to me if someone had used the same phraseology. Right. But it was pretty specifically identical. And then, and then she also started saying that he was having cognitive problems and that she was worried that he was declining into dementia, despite the fact that all of his friends, who knew him just as well as she did, if not better, said there was absolutely nothing along the lines of that going on with him. He was sharp. He was clear. He knew where he was. He knew yeah. what was going on. That was a load of crap, which leads a lot of... Uh, well, you know what a major cause of cognitive decline? Cats. A tiger tooth. A tiger tooth penetrating your oh, prefrontal cortex. That would do it. Yeah. That'll, that'll cause cognitive decline. That's what's causing Joe Biden's cognitive decline. That's why he's such a wreck. He yeah. has a fucking mess. He can barely speak. He's slurring. Can't believe the fucking Democrats are putting that asshole up against Trump. What a mother... What a, okay, sorry. Sorry, guys. I have a political podcast. Y'all want to check it out. It's in the description. Um, but uh, tiger teeth can make, make your brain turn into tiger poop. <laughs> Yep. So what I'm suggesting is, I mean, if she killed him, if you have big cats and you want to dispose of a body, well, you save a little money on food that day, right? Is right. that how that works? Are we because right. they don't? Then we don't they say like they just digest the bones? Like, yeah, this is she. I mean, to the degree that anyone in this documentary is actually possessing any expertise, somebody did say yes. The stomach's acidity is higher than that of ours. Bone simply disappears. Yeah, whether or not that's true, I don't know, but. Coming from a guy who has to clean up tiger poop, I'm guessing that's true. You cleaned up the tiger poop? No, the guy who said it. Oh, <laughs> you said that like you had experience. No, no. Coming from the guy who I had know. to clean up, not, heard, not me. Yeah, I know, I know. Well, you you grew up in an animal refuge kind of place, right? Like, you, well, you yeah. did, but you did more varmints. You were like a var. Like, how would you? Because I worked in the pet business. Mm -hmm. Actually, I, I worked in the aquarium uh, industry for about mm -hmm. a while. For uh, back in the day, you grew up. Were you guys taking in, like, uh, were you a business or just like... No, 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 no. We didn't get paid for any of it. It was the animal rehabilitation. So someone... Uh, but that, that's my question. Was how did anybody know about your thing? Did they, were you in the paper? Oh, like, no, no. Like, what, what happens is that there, you know, there's an agency who has a hotline. People call them whenever there is like an injured animal somewhere. And then they'll look to see where it's coming from. And they'll look to their list of licensed rehabilitators ah. and say, oh, well, you're closer. You're closer. You're closer. Go get the animal. Take it in. Then yeah. we'll go out. So the people never know about us. They just know about the organization can, that, that networks out. Okay. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, so like kind of like a foster system. Yeah, so, yeah, and um, and there's no funding that you get for taking care of animals. It's just basically people who who do it because they love animals yeah. and they care about these kind of things. And they don't mind a couple of raccoons sleeping in their bed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you had like raccoons, opossums, and geese, and birds, and uh, uh, like squirrels. Bunch of geese, bunch of squirrels, bunch of birds. Uh, yeah. Any uh, wolverines? No, I never had. A, I had a groundhog once, oh, twice, yeah? but not a wolverine. No. All animals are stronger than they look. Would you yes. agree to that? You know like what? babies. Ever hold a baby? Fucking strong yeah. as shit. You know what? Animal is probably one of the strongest that I would never admit that, that you wouldn't know it looking at them. That that shocked me when I was a kid. Raccoon? No. Oh. Just so fucking fish. fish. They're just like oh. fish. Fish? Yeah. I mean, you're sitting on the side of a boat and like straining against all your might to bring this thing in the boat. And then you pop it up and it's a sardine. <laughs> fish. Wait a minute. You mean... You mean... Fish are strong. Yeah. Well, they're fighting for their life. They're putting yeah. all their energy. Plus, I think they've got that tail, which makes mm -hmm. them propel themselves through water. Mm -hmm. So they're able to like gain. I don't know. I'm not. I'm trying to do like the the, the um, fluidity physics of mm -hmm. like a muscle pushing through using water as resistance medium or something. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's funny you say. Well, I mean, if you, a fish is just a tube of meat. Yeah, that's just like all. It's like if, if 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 your forearm was swimming around, you'd be like, "Wow, this fish is gross and weird and pink mm -hmm. and soggy, and it's a forearm." No, but like if it was just all muscle, it'd be hard to hold on to. 
Yep. I was not expecting you to go with fish in that one. Fish is strong. Um, but anyway, people in the pet trade, in the pet world, and these are like the big cat is like a subset of uh, more, one of the more dramatic subsets versus aquariums and raccoon rehabilitation. Mm-hmm. Um, what the hell I was asking you? Oh, there was something I was going with the, why we're both. Uh, you said, was it a business? Was it? No, no before that relating to her. Anyway, whatever. It doesn't matter. Um, so she, uh, oh, feeding the animal. They, mm-hmm. Well, I don't know. But do we think that she fed her husband to the tigers? Well, there's two leading theories that people have in the documentary, and that is that around the time of his disappearance, they were building or they were digging out this massive uh, septic tank. So people oh, yeah. were saying, dig up the septic tank. You'll either find Don Lewis in it or under it. With Jimmy Hoffa. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, of course, they, they mentioned that to Carol Bass. He goes, ha, 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 that's just preposterous. Yeah. It's like, you can't trust or read anything on her face. And the second theory is obviously that she fed the her husband to the tigers, which... She was like, well, if that were the case, there'd be something left over. There'd be blood and everything. Well, not really. Not if you strangle him, then freeze him in one of your freezers and then feed him through a wood chipper and then feed that to the tiger. I That's suppose. how you got to do it. Smart. <laughs> what? Like a, just a big pile of pulp? Just a pulpy? It'll be like little ice cubes. Yeah. Yeah. You pour them out in a little tray. Yeah. like when you when you make little orange, orange pops, orange mm-hmm. circles and stuff. Okay. Wow. Well, I'm definitely locking my door from now on, you <laughs> fucking psycho. Um, no, I saw a documentary I see guy James. who did that one time. Oh, really? But, you know, they caught him because he, he expelled the frozen remains into a lake. And w- for whatever reason, one of, like, the fingernails didn't get fully chopped up when he found the fingernail on the shore. Oh, man. So did they find other... Who sees a thing on the ground and is like, this is obvious. Well, they were looking for a body? Yeah, they like were... Investigators? Yeah. Like, okay, so they found a fingernail. Oh, my God. Man, this world's crazy. That's um, why you got to get the, the the good wood chippers. Yeah, fine chipping. Yeah, the fingernail. Like, yeah, yeah, not like those. Uh, not not the low rent paper shredders. Yeah, and they you, don't do cross hatches. You need the ones with the uh, the blood bags on the side that catch all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and that also uh, a vat of acid for it. Yes. But um, It'd be great if you just marketed teeth. a wood chipper specifically. It's like you advertise it. It'll chop up any corpse. <laughs> well, I wouldn't be surprised. This is mm-hmm. twenty twenty after all. Uh, all right, so. There's only, we're, we should keep moving along, though. So then uh, in the third episode, oh, Carol Baskin doesn't face any consequences for the missing husband. Like, right? Correct. I think they investigated. Yeah, she, she got away with it, but it's 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 uh, Joe Exotic's lifelong journey to expose her yeah. as a murderer for Don Lewis, and he will not live. He will not sleep until he sees her in prison. Yeah, and I don't honestly, I don't have a lot of confidence that she necessarily did kill the guy. I think I would bet probably, but it's yeah. not like, oh, obviously she did to me. Mm-hmm. I think others might have that conclusion, which is totally fine. She couldn't um, get the but, money from his death until he had been declared dead. And they won't declare him dead until he's been missing for five years. And oh, on yeah. five years and one day, she shows up to claim the money. What are you supposed to do? Wait two weeks? You waited well, five years. Go the day... Finally, wouldn't it make over. more sense yeah, if it was way. like a month or two later and you're like, oh, I wasn't even keeping track of yeah, it. I, yeah. I wasn't after him for the money in the first place. And right. It's, it looks pretty darn incriminating when you're there, like almost right at the deadline. If you killed him. But if you didn't kill him, you just went there the, the day of. But, but if is, you care, is it worse if he if he is actually I don't know. Yeah. I mean, because he might be in Costa Rica alive somewhere. Yeah. Which anyway. All right, so then we learn about Doc Antle, right? Is this episode three, roughly? I mean, they, they some of these storylines are overlapping. I don't need, we're not trying to hit all of them. Yeah, right. So it turns out, dude, go ahead. No, the thing about the Doc Antle episode is this kind of opens up with this guy who is, again, a cult leader. He has his own compound where everyone lives, and that most of the people that he associates with, I'm doing air quotes, is a group of like five women mm-hmm. who all apparently are his wives. Yeah, he's a who, polyamorous fella. Yes, who who the, came to his place when they were 17 or 19 years old each, mm-hmm. who never left, who he does all sorts of things with because he's a creepy old man cult leader. But at that point, I was thinking, okay, this guy's clearly weirder than Joe Exotic because the guy has five wives, who yeah. has five wives. I'd like to have five wives. Right. And then it was right around this time in the documentary where it was like, oh, by the way, Joe Exotic also has two husbands. Yeah. <laughs> and it was like, of course he does. <laughs> yeah. And that was the universe slapping me for thinking that Joe was more normal right. by comparison to this other guy. There's one guy they've been interviewing who has like three teeth 
and he's no shirt, pierced nipples, which is extremely distracting. It's impossible not mm-hmm. to stare at those things. Tattoos everywhere. Uh, and he's talking, it's clearly like he's like a worker at the facility or something. And he did, but then at one point they put up a graphic that says K K K Clayton K C C something was his name. Right. I don't remember his name. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Uh, and it says Joe's husband under the name. And you're like, wait a minute, husband. Wait, what? And then you learn that he's got more than one. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah so, just, so Doc Antle is the dude that does the stuff with the Hollywood or like, like it, with movies and films. And he has a bigger park. And all of his employees, although I imagine they have other workers, but he gets these young women to agree to like live there and work there. And they're all kind of attractive. I mean, I think I thought they're, you know, he's the, the guy, you know, he hacked the system somehow. He mm. put, put some malware into the matrix. Uh, and um, they work and do shows and they like show the tigers and all the different cat presentations to the audiences that come through. And, they seem okay, but there's also a sequence where they talk about how much they don't get any days off and it's just constant, never ending, seven days a week. And like, if you want to work in the big cat world, don't you dare expect Christmas off. Don't you dare. It's like, there's some labor abuses going yeah. on in this world too. Uh, and we also learned a bit about uh, um, Joe Exotic's staff as well. Mm-hmm. So, uh, well, just real quick, I'll summarize this. The thought, that's the thought I'm having. Like, they're all very loyal to him and they seem to be grateful because a lot of them are like ex-convicts or people on the outskirts of society who've fallen through some cracks and have been beaten up a little bit by the world. What? James is... Oh, yeah. No, yeah. Uh, <laughs> James is giving me sign language over here. I'm, uh, I want to stop your flow. No, 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 no. You, you aren't. And um, so they're, uh, you know, given a place where they can feel useful and connect with these big cats and be part of this, this crazy business and participate in this Joe and Joe. I imagine it's a pretty exciting place. I imagine there's booze and there's drugs and there's, and a lot of them seems to seem to be probably drug users or former drug users. Um, and uh, one of the crew, and I don't remember the name and they, she's interviewed throughout. And she's pretty reasonable. I was like, she's kind of like the voice. She seems to be a pretty practical minded person. And, uh, I did look for it because I watched the first episode again when James watched it for the first time and you don't notice it right away, <laughs> but they finally reveal through like a dramatic, like where they show like everybody running around because someone got, got attacked or bit. And it turns out one of the workers had put their arm through a hole or a fence or something and a tiger went out and took off the arm. And then they show that, and Joe Exotic, of course, says something like, I'll never be able to recover from this or some kind of like financial worries. Yeah, this park would never recover financially. Yeah, but to be fair, maybe it was a few hours after that because you do think about the different consequences yeah. of a of a big big thing. And, but but one, one thing to note to know about this character to understand her a little bit better is that she didn't lose her arm from the tiger. Wait, it what? was still attached in the hospital, and she even signed her name on something with that arm. Oh. The doctor told her she said either we can amputate it. Or you're looking at two years of rehabilitation and, and follow-up surgeries. And it's a big mess. It was a it was a messy. Yeah, deal. And, and she was yeah. like, "Yeah, I don't want to deal with that. Just amputate it." Yeah, and she didn't care. And like seven days later, she's back at work. Yeah, so she <laughs> that's loyalty. <laughs> so below the elbow, she had some like I don't know a third of the forearm left, mm-hmm. and it still moves around a bit. That's where most of the forearm muscles yeah. are, anyway. I guess they're sort of weighted towards the elbow, and. Uh, and then you see, like you, you they, they do like a wider shot. Even they do, they were showing it before, but you, I didn't notice it. Neither did you. No, it's no. funny that that that, that worked. Because um, I wish I'd been like, hey, wait a minute, she's not, she doesn't have any arm. She's missing an arm. And she, and, and the, one of the guys who works there is missing both his legs. Yeah, he's got <laughs> not not from tigers, but, but that's from, yeah, that's totally unrelated to the tigers. Yeah. Like, what was his? How did he lose his legs? Do you recall? Um, he did say, was it an accident? I think it was some kind of. It was, it was the type of accident, yeah. Some sort of vehicle accident. I think. I really, honestly, I don't remember at all. A skiing? Are skis uh, considered vehicles? Uh, I don't think so. It, it wasn't skiing. It, yeah. I remember yeah, when I, I heard it, I, I thought, oh, well, that makes sense. What the hell did I but, think of skiing? Uh, it, yeah, it was totally like, oh, man, that guy, that, that sucks. Yeah. He lost the and he's totally fine with it. He doesn't seem to be too bothered mm-hmm. by having, not having this. And he's got uh, good prosthetics. and Yeah, so... From then on, though, when she's on, you're like, or at least shortly after, you're like, wow, she is not bothered by losing her arm, and she's just working back there, and she went no back fear. to work within a week or whatever. Yeah. So interesting. She's a very kind of peculiar character. I thought she was I'm, pretty compelling. That's the one kind of mistake you can make that you can legitimately say, well, I'll never do that again. Yeah, 
Yeah, if if you mean scratch my head with my left hand, because <laughs> I'll never do that again. Yeah, <laughs> I'll never. Yeah. Um, so at least with that arm. Right. Right. That's so why technically we, she could do it again. She could do it again. Yeah. That's why you have a spare. Yeah. We have a spare arm. Um, so that's kind of pretty sad. And you're kind of wondering how that doesn't happen more often. Mm-hmm. I guess the cats they're held from a very young age most of them were part of the cub petting so they're very uh, used to people yeah but you you can't and, breed um, the wild out of a animal completely not if, especially when they show them feeding that's something yeah. i found kind of sad there's moments where they show the food thing and doc antel i think says like it costs ten thousand dollars oh that, yeah that was a funny thing because yeah. doc antel has a lot more money a much more established uh yeah. resources set of resources and he says it cost me ten thousand dollars a month to feed a tiger. Yeah, you no, know, I think you no. Know, he says I think it, it was a month. Yeah, yeah he said yeah. it cost me ten thousand dollars a month to properly feed a tiger. Right, and then it cuts immediately. To Joe Exotic, he's like, I can feed him a tiger for three thousand dollars. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for three thousand. And so let's talk about that a little bit. So they like we we get cows. So we get like so they have relationships with like the feed lots around there. So they're getting like bovine. Yeah. Like, Dairy cows and yeah, other anytime cows. Anytime a probably, cow dies or something, yeah. they come they go get the carcass. The police call them if they have roadkill. If there's roadkill, to... yep. <laughs> and then which is kind of funny too, because I guess what you gotta get rid of the animal somehow, I suppose. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's, you could leave it in the woods. But if you're the cops around there, you're like, well, we got a tiger guy, we'll just, you know, let him have it. Yeah. Mafia says we got another body for yeah, you. Yeah, maybe. Mm-hmm. Um but then the funny food source that they use is Walmart will have expired meat. That is still edible, and they get all these big, huge shipments of meat, like packaged meat, like bologna packages. Bologna, 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 <laughs> bologna. That's fancy. That's not okay with it. That's a, that's an accepted pronunciation. I don't. That's only not for someone that. who uh, uses gray poop on. I put gray poop on. Uh, I, <laughs> gray poop. <laughs> I put gray poop on my bologna. <laughs> um. Yeah, bologna, bologna, bologna. Bologna? Why, not? Why does that sound like Bologna has a first name. It's O S C A R. Yeah. It's B O L O G N E. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've been in the Oscar Mayer big uh, truck. No, I haven't. I've been near it. I've seen it a bunch of times. <laughs> He's like, Great I've been story. to Mount Rushmore. Oh, no, I just saw a picture of it. I have been around Mount Rushmore. And the thing everybody was excited about was these goats. There are goats. Mm-hmm. There's like a pile of rubble at the bottom of it, and a bunch of goats are. If you go through running around, it was like, goats. Look at the goats. Goats are way cooler than those fucking yeah. people. Um, Anyway, so all these meat packages, bacon and whatever, anything that you buy at Walmart that's meat, you know, full on actual meats, but processed meats. And the dudes who work there just take the meat. Well, did, did you? I mean, uh, they, they look through it and they take the stuff that's not so expired and they right. eat it. And so they're all they're like, and I think they said they're only getting paid like 100 bucks or 120 bucks a day. And or, that's the only way they can eat. Yeah. Yeah. So they're they're they not being the paid stuff. well. And I don't, I doubt they're like taxes are all being properly processed through the payroll yeah. system and but other, they're taking meat from expired meat other from disgusting the is later on in the show he opens a, <laughs> a pizza restaurant yeah and someone's one of you being interviewed gets asked about it and he, they say something like so the meat on that pizza that was the walmart meat and yeah they said yep they're using the walmart meat because he's cutting costs he's saying yeah yeah but can you remember what the walmart meat really was it wasn't necessarily i mean they said expired meat, but then they later on clarified what they meant by that. Well, I don't know what. So if someone goes into a Walmart, and this is what they claim, if it's wrong, it's wrong, I don't know. But you put some meat in your cart, you go up to check out, and it turns out, oh, I got, I didn't realize there was already one in there. My wife put something in there, so I want to take that one back. Or they turn, oh, my check doesn't clear, my car doesn't work, we need to restock these. Once it leaves the cooler, for any reason, it... It never goes back. It becomes oh, really? unsellable. Oh. Unless, like, the customer goes back and puts it back themselves. The store themselves will not do that. Really? Because they can't trust That's that what they someone... said. Yeah, right. it's, it's been out of the... Because, I mean, if someone else buys it after the fact, if it's been sitting somewhere for, like, 10 minutes or so, and they put it back, and then oh. they get sick, that right. could be a lawsuit. They may have walked around the store for an hour and a half with this meat in their Yeah, cup, you, know? you just don't know. And it's the fear of liability really drives a lot of food yeah. waste. Like the delis at the grocery stores. They don't throw that shit out, man. They mm-hmm. just dump it in the garbage. All that good food that someone could eat. Uh, anyway, that's... um. Yeah, I missed that 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 point. So they get off... They get, all this meat was just funny. Um, all right, where are we going now? Doc Antle and... Uh, well, we're talking about the difference between how much it costs to feed a tiger for a month and how Joe Exotic was able to do it for 3000 versus 10000 Yeah, yeah. That's about it, though. There's not much else yeah. to say about that. Um, where now? 
So Doc Antle's polyamorous. Doug, uh, right, and then we find out about that, and then we cut back to Joe, and we find out Joe is already married to this uh, toothless man. Yeah, uh, Chris. Was mm-hmm. his name Chris? I think it was Chris. Yeah. yeah. And then we find out that at some point another young man meets Joe. Travis. Who, yes. A hottie. Him. He was a real handsome, tall, yes. like good looking guy from what seemed like a troubled background, though. Yeah. I, so, I got the sense that the poor fella probably came from some chaos in his yeah. background. Which which we find out, I mean, seems to be true. Right. Yeah. His um, his family seems to have a history of meth addiction. One would presume. Um Which it, is the sad part. They show it. that he smokes a lot of weed, yeah. and but then at the near the end of the uh, series, they reveal that he'd been being supplied with meth. So they were doing, right. There was drug use going on there, right? And that's what um, Joe Exotic does. He for companionship, he takes broken people who have addictions, and and I don't know, maybe it's too early to say this, but not, neither of his husbands were gay. Yeah. Okay. So those guys, yeah, I mean, it doesn't, it's not a binary in any way. Obviously, they had some kind of sexual fluidity that um, other men don't have. And it's because there's a gradient. So people have different tolerances within how their own, like, uh, sexuality is strictly or not strictly defined. If you have a gay experience once, I don't know if that makes you gay. If you marry a guy, and I assume that they do what... Married people do and fight, fight and <laughs> wrestle, <laughs> um, divorce, and uh, argue about children and stuff. Um, I bisexuals. I mean, the word doesn't really matter, but the, just to say that they're straight, he seems like a little like that word is also not that accurate in my opinion. I don't know what it is but exactly. I'm, and I, I'm, I'm, I don't know. It's, I'm not like trying to. Um, I don't have like a particularly strong. I'm not sure what the fuck I'm trying to say. But like they married a dude and then they're like, yeah, but I'm straight. It's like mm. you married a guy. Because he was given the meth. And then you married two guys. I know that they were like caught up in his web mm. and stuff, but, you know, that's fine. You know, and they can be straight too. Okay. That's, mm-hmm. It's okay if they want to say that. I don't care. Uh, it was just, I'm not sure what I'm trying to say. I'm fumbling my words a little bit. But it's, it's interesting to me that, that. But the documentary presented it as though they were not of the same persuasion as Joe right. and they were only with him because Joe fulfilled a need that they had yeah. which was exploiting a weakness basically yeah because they said that the one guy was sleeping with the waitress or something and that Travis the he was banging like multiple women there too yeah and so um yeah uh which, bi, they're by I guess what if you have to use a word no, well I mean it, it doesn't matter though. basically the way it presented, I'm only I'm only quibbling with the idea that they're like i'm straight I'm like you married two guys <laughs> well i mean i mean if it's you, totally possible it's fine right i mean yeah. i i knew someone who was a good friend of my family whose husband left her after their third child saying oh sorry i, I i've never been attracted to women wait oh the guy said that yeah and, then, and he yeah. left her for a man yeah yeah well there's a lot of that i think there's more like closeted yeah, I guess that's the term. It's like right, there's so, a lot more closeted gay than closeted straight. Right, but you can't in the uh, world. Th- that guy was always gay, right? And yet he married a woman. Sure. Yeah. That happens so, a lot. so that you, and it's common. feasible that there could potentially be a situation where a guy marries another guy, but yeah. he's not gay because he, he was he was exploiting Joe in a different way that Joe was exploiting him. True. Yeah. It was an unhealthy relate. And to say it's a phase, and that's fine too. Yeah. Is there such a I know you think of symbiotic relationships and parasitic relationships. Is there any type of work relationship where it's harmful on both sides? Yeah, like what is the opposite of symbiotic? Um, yeah, I don't think there is one like because double parasites. Yeah, or something. Just like two leeches biting. But Joe has more power. Joe was the established guy with the business and the money and the yeah. You know, so he was really the one taking advantage of. It wasn't like an even exchange. No, no, no. Because I felt terrible for Travis. I really, I, you, you could just sort of see him. Um, it looked like he wasn't real excited to be with the cats. It's not like he was a passionate cat person. Mm-hmm. Something about these cats inspires a lot of uh, passion, I guess, in mm-hmm. people, but not him so much because um, he seemed to be enjoying like shooting guns and driving around on the ATV and being sort of, um, you know, he's like 20 years old. 
You know, yeah. he's got a lot of energy. That's a that's a pretty especially if you come from a chaotic background. And mm-hmm. so Joe, we'll get back to Travis eventually, as people who've already seen it know what happens. But um when do we introduce the the governor campaign? So he runs for office. Oh <laughs> that's like yeah. episode or or did the other business partner come into the I scene think the other business partner own? came in before that. Was it? The Las Vegas guy. I'm thinking it was right after, but it Maybe might have been, uh, been before. I th- well, I remember the Las Vegas guy criticizing him for using yeah. zoo money for campaign purposes. Right. Maybe it was. So it was right been. around the same time, probably. Right. Yeah. Well, I'd say he would have to come in slightly before. Well, or he, I mean, he could be critical of him after he had learned about the finances. He, so this guy with lots of money, fuck, I don't know his name now, um, comes in and he, he lives like a, a banging porn star's life somehow. Like he's got money and he like, like all these sort of trashy-ish hot women are around him for some reason mm-hmm. some photos at least i guess that's something you can arrange and uh he's off oh, so joe is struggling the, the the park is failing like there's or the, the money cash flow issues are going on i don't know exactly how it all gets why it's all going down but so he needs the- he needs a big cash injection bad so he's he he sort of courts this guy and gets him because he's this guy did like there's like lower play lower uh rent not not lower rent but smaller player big cat collectors that have like four cats or like 10 cats and i don't know how many this guy has because there's just because there's other people in this world that like the the, the, the chubbier guy with like the long mm. straight hair uh, not super long but like the really straight you know he the, mm. he, he was what was his deal like he ran a pawn shop or something or yeah, he, he, he was like a strip club owner or something. Yeah, strip like club business guy. And he he was actually fairly practical too. He had kind of a, yeah. a good head on his shoulders. But I, I think we missed something that's kind of key. Yeah, we're saying yeah. that the, the, the zoo was falling on harsh times, right? Right. Yeah. That was because of the settlement of a million dollars against him for trying to use for copyright infringement of the big cat. Oh yeah, big cat rescue. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's he a steals huge, that's their a huge... whole logo. Yeah, he steals everything about so. Carol Baskin and her husband, Howard, her new husband, who is this tiny, squirrely accountant looking guy. Who, nice, nice enough guy. They seem like a decent pairing. Who They get along. They, they have pictures of him wearing a leash and wearing like a Tarzan leotard. Uh-huh. Little bit out there and wearing Halloween. like cat ears and cat face paint for a guy. Little... little un- I mean, not, not not totally weird, but a little... Yeah, but if you... A little further than I would go. Right, but... Jared, that's the cat culture. He's you know? an eccentric person. Yeah. I used to put gills on when I used to do fishing. Yeah, yeah. No, no. Um, but yeah, he fits with Carol. They're both yeah. they're both cat loonies. Yes. So, so yeah, you're right. This yes. is a big part. So Joe basically finds out that when you Google anything about cats or big cats, the first result you always get is always Carol Baskin. And that's how she's sucking up all the social media attention. And he takes a lot of right. offense to that because he considers himself to be the Tiger King. He is the greatest thing in the world. And his name should never fall below freaking Carol Baskin. So yeah. he tries to start using the algorithm to his advantage by changing the name of his organization from like the GW Zoo to Big Cat Rescue. Or and, something. Yeah, Big Cat then, Rescue something. And then something yeah. entertainment at the very, yeah, inter- yeah, entertainment at the bottom. Right. But the entertainment is in faded text, so you can barely see it. Yeah. And he uses like the same font. Same font, same logo, looks, same looks design. Really similar. It is almost completely indistinguishable from the one that's being used by Carol Baskin's company. So part of his harassment campaign against her mm-hmm. in his videos, but he'd also like threaten to... In the video, like with a snake, he's got snakes oh, and yeah. saying like, "Yeah, we're gonna put we're gonna put snakes in your t- in your mailbox." And then like snakes showed up in her mailbox or something like that. I don't mm-hmm. know if he said he's gonna put them in the mailbox, but um, he, at one point he shoots a mannequin in the head. He likes to pull his gun out and just fire it too. Like I, I wouldn't really be friends with a guy who uh, whipped out his pistol. And he loves and, being filmed, like walking towards the camera with yeah. his gun. He's always shooting it whenever he gets a chance. <laughs> He's pretty reckless with the. Yeah, I've taken hunter safety course training, and I've held guns. I was getting given guns for Christmas. I had just one gun, I guess. But uh, when I was thirteen years old, my dad gave me a twelve gauge, and uh, so I, I have a lot of respect for guns. I, I I hate them. I think they're terrible for the world. I would rather a world without guns. But uh, you should respect the power they have. And it's important. And most gun people, the vast majority of people who are into guns do respect their guns. But oh, this yeah. guy is not one of them. Yeah. And and you should have trigger discipline and know where the barrel is always pointing and know what's if it's loaded. Especially, you always treat any gun as if it is loaded. I mean, there's there's certain practices you should do to try to not shoot somebody. Yeah. He 
none of which he follows at all my favorite part is when he's like in the cage with the, the tigers and one tiger sniffs his shoe and then grabs his shoe and starts dragging him well, away okay that's a little that one was he like jd you son of a b i'm shooting his gun in the air well he's shooting it at the ground next at to the, the tiger. yeah but that one and that one he was talking about he says that he thinks someone put cologne on the shoes because the mm-hmm. tiger was clearly interested in his shoes yeah in a way that was unusual and it's because mm-hmm. the tiger kept going after his shoes and eventually bit it and just started dragging and then he starts mm-hmm. beating it with his um he's got that i don't know what they call them walker it's not yeah, yeah. it's a cane it's the yeah. ones that goes up around your arm yeah for, walker Texas sort Rangers. of disabled i actually found that kind of charming that he didn't let his uh knee brace or his mm-hmm. use of that device like in any way inhibit him i thought that was yeah. pretty good like like I would probably be, I get self-conscious and I mean, not that you're supposed to be that. I, I like that he was sort of just as bold, kind of disabled. He was disabled in some ways. Oh, yeah, yeah. Use, he had to use no, he had a lot of health problems too. Yeah, health issues. But he starts beating the tiger <laughs> with, the, with the cane thing. And then he pulls out his gun and sh- is shooting near the tiger. Yeah. <laughs> so, but that that was partially, I think we've, we've, we've jumbled the timeline a little bit, but that was closer to the end I think oh yeah, yeah. I only mentioned like, that because he was using the gun at that point yeah yeah so uh, Carol Baskin and Howard sue him and he loses big time and they there's a big judgment against him and he owes her a bunch of money so she's now got a major win on him yeah she's and like, he's even more enraged than he was before yeah she takes his tour bus another big vehicle he had yeah cripples his ability to do his rodeos and his tours and all that kind of stuff yeah. so he's Feel, not only did he suffer an immense financial setback, but it was at the hands of Carol Baskin, which just eats away at him. Yeah, it drives him just mad with yeah. anger. and and Because and, um, he's I'd probably a narcissist, I'd say. Yeah. It's probably safe to say. So it, that was violated in a really grand way, and he had to get back at her. Did we mention he even uh, wrote and performed a song called Here Kitty Kitty, where it's the whole point of the song is... Carol Baskin feeding the scraps of Don Lewis's corpse to a tiger. No, I do. I do kind of remember that. We did not mention that. But. <laughs> and he even uses her name in the song, yeah. Carol and Don. And yeah. So we got to mention the reality show too, just real quick. Yeah. So he brings in this reality show guy who he's like this reporter producer guy who um, realizes he's sitting on maybe a gold mine or some, mm-hmm. this is sort of a, this it wouldn't be weird to see a reality show built around this guy like these these no. like kooky pawn stars or they just take like a, some sort of weird business and as long as the people running it have a modicum of personality or something interesting and this would definitely qualify as like uh, would be an interesting show mm-hmm. to make so he he brings in some professionalism more than what they can offer yeah they do some green screen stuff and they they put this throne on this pile with some tigers and they do like a drone shot flying over it mm-hmm. and uh you know kind of classic reality show editing and graphics and so they produce sort of like a pitch or a package mm-hmm. of um of joe exotic and he i think he loves that i think that's the kind of oh, attention yeah. he's craving um so anyway that because reality show guy he he gives kind of a a voice of reason mm-hmm. s- story for or perspective during the, the the series there's really not much more to say about him in a way i mean he's in the he's in there he was involved but he doesn't he's not like moving the chess pieces around much in, right in the show would you agree yeah so then the governor thing and the investor guy who i think his name was mike am i getting that right uh it the, could be. the las vegas rich guy um well, let's talk about the governorship. So then he decides to run for governor. I think the laws were coming after him or maybe the laws were being threatened to be changed because that's one thing Carol did. She was out there trying to change the law. So he decided he's going to fight back. And he made a bit of a splash in Ohio, the Ohio governor race that year. Mm-hmm. Was that 2016? Uh, I think somewhere it was around there, yeah. yeah. And um, he um, completely clueless, has no idea what the hell he's doing. Uh, knows how to talk, you know, he, he sort of, no, there's no shortage of words for this fella, point a camera at him and he can just kind of go. So he's good at getting attention. He spends a bunch of money on t-shirts and promotional stuff. And he's like out there running around and people, they notice him. He stands out. And even they even show some people like voters just being like, you know, he's better than all the other assholes. They're like, yeah, he's, you know, he, he's a little different, but I like, you know, I like that. It's not, he's not like everybody else. You get kind of that sense that, even though he's obviously out of his mind, 
um, really funny commercials and like the show is both tragic and hilarious mm-hmm. almost all at the same time. And it's sort of sad. I feel bad for everybody more than anything. I, I tend to just look at people and think of them as dealing with pain that they're they're processing and um, a lot of life is um, driven by coping how you how you develop coping skills around pain management. Emotional pain is what really what I mean. But like your childhood and things are fucked up and sometimes it spins you off into dangerous trajectories. Sometimes it spins you off into somewhat troubled, but okay. Not that troubled, but you know, sort of okay or not okay at all or very successful. I wish I had the kind of mental illness that made you wildly successful. That's certainly frustrating. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't have that. I just have the, the sad depression, you know, that stuff. Um, so the governor thing, I don't know anything you want to say about that. Or like he, he, go ahead. You, well, you no, I was, I was, I think maybe to kind of step back a tiny, yeah. tiny bit. When Joe Exotic was in legal trouble with Carol Baskins, he tried this tactic where he would constantly change the name of his zoo or change the name of his organization to try and invalidate the legal paperwork and force them to refile under the new name, which is absolutely hilarious. If that's your legal defense, (laughs) just annoy your opponent to death, (laughs) which is great. But then when that failed to work, he lost the case and he had to pay a judgment settlement of like a million dollars to Carol Baskin. And she started stripping him clean of all his assets. He tried putting the company in the name of other people. He put it in his mother's name and then they came and stripped everything away from his mother, which was horrible. Yeah. Um, and then he was kind of destitute at that point, didn't really know where to turn. And then this Las Vegas investor guy comes in and he's a con man himself. Yeah. He presents as though he has money, but everything he has is a rental or a false facade or an outright lie. Right. The cars he drives, the, the people he hangs out with, it's all a sham. Mm hmm. And he, go ahead. But uh, he convinces Joe Exotic to sign the zoo over to him for legal protection. Yeah. And that was the beginning of the end for Joe Exotic. Because Joe saw it as a, as a source of money and they're going to invest and build up and build right. a whole bunch of new infrastructure or build stuff, cages and whatever. But uh, it, it also means a major power shift because now Joe runs around kind of with this new guy on the scene who no one really knows what his whole deal is. The crew, his crew, don't really like him at all because the the power dynamic is completely f- different now, and mm-hmm. um, so his presence makes for a lot of tension. As well as the fact that we find out that he didn't, re- he was really kind of scamming them all. Mm-hmm. Like he didn't actually have as much money as he was pretending at all. Um, so, but his presence in the movie, he does get involved in the park more than I thought. I thought actually thought he would be off the the, the stage a little quicker than he was because he's kind of around till the end, isn't he? Like yeah. he's. Because he he worked with them for a few years, so he he does integrate into the yeah. group, I guess. Um, the meme going around for him is a picture of him with the text. This is what Axe body spray would look like if it were a person. Yeah, yeah. Who didn't die? Uh, yeah. You know, in a in a jumping from one building to another accident. Mm. That's how that's how you're supposed to die when you're dumb. Yeah. <laughs> I bet I can do it, man. You know, I can fucking do it. It's not that far. My brother was in track. <laughs> It's not that far at all. Look, let's throw something, okay? See? <laughs> they did it in the Matrix. <laughs> I once said, uh, there's a more to the story, but we, uh, rooftop party in Chicago, like a 30-story building, and across the street was like a 28-story building. I'm just making up the numbers, but the, the one across the street was a little lower, and it had a pool on the roof. Oh, well, no. It was the air show, so a lot of people in Chicago have, um, like, parties on we were up there with like um, a bunch of uh, limes mm-hmm. and other things, and we were throwing... <laughs> We're throwing limes across across the street and trying to land them in the pool on this other building. And the last thing we we were getting pretty drunk. Mm-hmm. And very, I ended up puking in their bathroom that day. I got sun poisoning, I think, and, and a lot of alcohol. It was a bad mix. I was like laying next to the toilet for like an hour or two. Mm-hmm. It was a bad scene. This is my twenties. And um, the, the final thing we had to throw was a uh, onion. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't think I. I'm trying. I can't remember. Someone throws the onion. Bad throw. It doesn't hit the roof. It hits a window on the side of the building and breaks it. So now we've got glass crashing down about 20 plus stories. Oh, no. <laughs> we just fucking ran. Did I just confess to a crime? <laughs> Maybe. This was 15 years ago, by the way. I'm sure they're looking for the, yeah. the Chicago So but we were like, oh, shit. Oh, fuck. <laughs> we, I mean, I, I felt bad. But uh, yeah, don't, don't throw onions at... Yeah, high rise towers or something. And don't eat them either. They're not food. <laughs> hey, you chop them up, mix them with some eggs, and you have a great time. All right. So, what the fuck was that? Why did I why did I tell that story? Um, 
No idea. Carol Baskins. <laughs> yup, on the roof. Yeah, the onion guy. No, the Las Vegas guy. Uh, we got to get to the end, though. We're already over okay. an hour. If, if we jump over to, to what the crux of everything happening is, yeah. he runs for con- he runs for president, loses, no. of course. Governor. Runs for governor. governor. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Pres- he did run for president. Yes, he ran for president, and then he ran for governor when that didn't work out. <laughs> That's right. Turns out he was using funds from his park to fund his political campaign to print out condoms with his picture on them and all this bizarre stuff. Yeah. So that all... Ju- that all was really bad. So the FBI starts looking, the feds are already looking into him. And meanwhile, he is making overt threats to Carol Baskin on a daily basis. So, and Travis. Tra- that's what I was going to say. Let's do Travis then the ending. So, because the campaign relates to, so another character we meet is his campaign manager, who's like kind of just a regular dorky guy you'd expect to be working at Best Buy or something like this right. sort of a, doughy guy but he meets him because he's working in and like a the, walmart in the gun section the gun section at walmart because we know joe goes there all the time because yeah. he buys this explosive material and shoots it all the time he goes hey! every time it blows up yeah yeah he buys some kind of like granulated explosives powder which yeah. is somehow illegal and but if you shoot it it blows it's a big yeah. bo- it's a bomb so it's his favorite thing in the world i don't, I don't think that's how you're supposed to use it but you could shoot no. the container and it blows up so this guy He's fairly level-headed, but he's like, you know, I knew about politics and uh, mm-hmm. I've always wanted to work in it. And, you know, I thought this is crazy, but I I can maybe do this. So he agrees to be the campaign manager. He's, he's a libertarian. Like, I'm, a, I'm a libertarian. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he's just, I was like, I think you're in over your head a little mm-hmm. bit there, buddy. But he, so he works with him on the campaign. And this is also the culmination of Travis's story. Uh, and this, this guy's presence is, is there, the campaign manager, yeah. throughout the rest of the series. But he is... Talking about Travis and how it's kind of getting like worse. He wasn't working at all, and, and yeah. his drug use was escalating, and he and was acting a little bit uh, uncertain, carrying a gun around. He wakes and, people up by pointing a gun at him. Yeah, he, yeah, that's not okay. Don't no yeah, like um, Goodfellas where the guy's wife has the gun. Yeah. Um, and so there's this really harrowing moment. Uh, it was hard to watch. Where it's a camera, you see Travis, uh, sort of an isometric viewpoint, sort of security camera. Yeah. And a cluttered office, and the dude is sitting pretty much dead center of the shot. Not that they framed it like that, mm-hmm. but he's very clear. You see Travis moving, and then Travis leaves the frame, and he's got a gun. And then all of a sudden, I don't think there's sound. But the mm-hmm. guy's reaction, he's just like Edward uh, the Scream, who's mm-hmm. the painter. Is that Van Gogh? What the fuck? That sounds so stupid. I was about to say Edward R. Murrow. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he did it. Why don't, why don't, is that Van Gogh, right? Um, it, it the looks scream. the scream looks like Van Gogh, but I feel like it's such a famous painting that it can't like be it him. Else. Anyway, it, God, I'm dumb. I don't think it's Van Gogh. Yeah, whatever. So, but uh, both hands, uh, Macaulay Culkin, Home Alone, same yes. same move. Hands to the mouth. I mean, you know immediately what it was, though. Um, yeah. I think you see a bit of like a puff or like a, maybe a flash, yeah. but like Travis shoots. Travis himself. Had killed himself yeah, right gun. in the head. Yeah. Right in the head, and and this dude is just frozen. He's stand, you know, he's just hands to the face, just mouth agape, completely stunned. And it's hard to watch. It's just watching another person watch someone die is difficult. At least for me, I was like, ah, Jesus, this is intense, man. That was really intense. Yeah. And it goes, he gets up and he's like, I think maybe he would. Then I thought it would, maybe he was joking around. Like it's because your mind doesn't really process it completely. It's the same reaction you see people have in prank shows. And you always think that, if, oh, the show's got to be fake because if it was real, the reaction would be much bigger. But it's no. People in shock shut down. Yeah. Especially with um, sudden, a yeah. sudden unexpected outburst of incredible yeah. violence. Um, yeah, it's really sad. So this Travis guy is dead. And now we have his funeral, and which is also kind of a shit show. And so, of course... Oh, God. Uh, I almost called him Lee Exotic, uh, crossing my my. Uh, I almost called him Joe 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 Sizemore. Yes, um, the life exotic <laughs> <laughs> with Steve Zizou. Yes. And uh, anyway, at Travis's funeral, and of course he's heartbreaking. You know, he's a lot of tears. He seems to be pretty upset by it. Um, and but yet he dresses as a reverend. Dresses up as a reverend or <laughs> cowboy. He just has this crazy <laughs> outfit, and he's singing. And the guy's mom is there, and she's. I got that sense. This is just based on watching her and in the little bit of moments where she was on this camera and she probably was going through with some kind of withdrawal, the, the way she was moving her hands around and she was kind of like very nervously shifting around. Granted, she's at her son's funeral. So what the hell do I know how she behaves? I'm not saying as a judgment, but I'm guessing that he and his family, Travis and 
his family probably have drug issues and mm -hmm. which means emotional issues which means like an un unregulated or even drug addiction can be treated with a lot more compassion and intelligence than we do in this country generally it's a pretty difficult difficult thing especially when it gets really dark so she's suffering the guy's mom but joe exotic moves on real quick he finds a new husband within like two months he Did says i thought I met him on the chat chat rooms <laughs> he was you, on chat somewhere do you want to go into the eulogy that he gave at the funeral I don't even remember it much. He sings. I remember him doing no, singing. that horrible thing I told you before. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, you remember it better than I do. About so he's telling stories about Travis, and they had a lot of fun. I mean, they were they were probably pretty pretty hard partying crowd yeah. on, at the Big Cat Sanctuary slash exploitation farm. Do you want me to say it? Oh yeah, go for okay. it. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can fill in the details. Please. I don't want to. A a any moist, heavy, wrinkled details, please, uh, mm -hmm. Wayne. And he, but part of one of the humorous anecdotes, like I, I talked at my grandma's funeral recently, mm -hmm. uh, in February. I hope and, to God uh, you didn't say the same thing. I did my act. No, I said, "Hey, <laughs> boy, being bald, huh? Boy, being bald really sucks, doesn't it?" Hey, that's my that's my stand up. That's one of my stand up bits. Um, I didn't have a receding hairline. I had a fleeing hairline. Mm -hmm. Ha! Now you laugh. Pay me, motherfucker. <laughs> um, no, but I, I did speak at my grandma's funeral, and I told a, a little anecdote about like how. When we were kids, at the we had a little lake house, and I knocked my brother into the water on accident, and she jumped in and rescued him. And I just remember, you know, so I shared a memory, which is what you do at a funeral. Mm -hmm. I got a few laughs actually. It's the first set I'd done in a while; I hadn't been on stage mm -hmm. in quite a bit. Um, because I, I, I felt anyway. Why am I talking about my grandma's funeral now? But you know, I have public speaking uh, skill doing stand up for so long. So anyway, uh, Joe, <laughs> Joe tells a story about. Travis is uh, one thing he liked to do is pull his balls out and put them on your face or what was it? Yes. Put them right on his face. Put them right on his face and how they were huge and heavy and warm. <laughs> I don't remember it that well. <laughs> but yeah, like, like his mother's in the front row, devastated. And he's everybody there is pretty emotional, I would imagine. And um, he tells a story about um, this, the tea bag. Uh, yeah, and how everyone's seen them. Yeah, everyone's seen them. I think they've probably all seen everybody naked. You know, they all had not not even sexual. I just mean like you know, there's all kinds of crazy nights there, mm -hmm. guns and booze and cats and you know, um. So, yeah. So he t he does tell the the anecdote about young Travis's huge balls. <laughs> <laughs> Very little filter on Joe Exotic, yeah. which is one of the reasons yeah. like he had the life of the Harry life he had in the. Man, anyway. And, you know, like two months later, like you said, Mary's Dylan invites, oh, yeah, Dylan is a new invites one. the mother of his ex husband to yes. the wedding. Yes. And the mother, they and there's only four her. people there. Right. Yeah. Oh, that's right. And yes, that was really Machiavellian, if that's mm -hmm. the right use of that word, yeah. where she, the mother was being interviewed and she's talking about how he seems so devastated but then he's two months later he's already found somebody yeah and then he invites me to the wedding and she said she didn't want to go but she agreed to, she's like okay fine figuring it'd be like a big wedding yeah. and it was she was one of the two witnesses or, or there was the pastor or whatever yeah and the and him and the new guy and but the they made it clear that like this was to show that she's okay with it like he mm -hmm. he wouldn't have invited her i don't know it was very weird it was, and the weird thing is is that this wasn't him marrying. Was it him marrying? Actually, no, it was his first double marriage when he married Travis that he had. It was yeah. the two husbands. He was already there. married to the first guy, Chris, if that's his name. And then he brought Travis in. and But then Travis married them both. Right. right. So then there were a three, a three bull. A and then, bowl. oh, that's three. right. And then Dylan married him, but his first, first husband the nipple pierce yes. missing teeth. The guy. one who had the tattoo that said like property of exotic Joe below yeah. his navel. Between his belly button and his uh other thing. Yeah. yeah. His other button. Um yes. <laughs> I have the same tattoo. Yeah. Yeah. It's right next to the barcode, or right above my tramp stamp. Right next to my nutrition facts. Yeah. So um, so if we okay. If we jump straight to the core thing of what's going on. We've covered pretty much pretty much it yeah so, so yeah. essentially what happens is that joe exotic does not does not cease on his carol baskin threats right and it gets to the point where the las vegas guy and the strip club guy start trying to 
It's almost like they try and assist him in solving the Carol Baskin problem by Mm -hmm. offering to help him find ways to kill her or to get someone to kill her by looking up a Google Earth and Google Maps and bike paths. Because she rides her bike across her property every day. She does live vlogging from it. So you know exactly where she's going to be at any given point in the morning. So they were using that to get like sniper positions of where they could take her out and trying to find out who would do it and all this kind of stuff. Right. But it seemed like Joe Exotic was kind of secondary to that process. He he was in the same room, but he wasn't the one making the planning. Right. And then later on, we find out that there's a transcript of a phone call or a text message or something where one of them says, hey, I can get a guy here to do it. And Joe says, really? How much? Is is that enough, though? I mean, that's that's the yeah. And doesn't he say something like, "I, I can find someone that wants to make ten thousand dollars"? Oh yeah, like he's that. yes, he says that. But yeah. he, he no, he actually says that in response to when he burned down his own alligator enclosure to kill the footage from the producer that we didn't touch on. Oh yeah, that's right. So the the burning down all the foot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what was the point? Was that was burning it down connected to the Carol Baskin thing or just no, like his he, relationship with the yeah he didn't reality. like the way things were going because he he got into an argument with a producer when the producer effectively said everything that I'm shooting here is my property it belongs oh. to me contractually it belongs to me oh yeah you have no rights over he this. wouldn't even have his own show yeah, yeah so he freaks out and goes and talks to his attorney and of course he's filming it and the attorney doesn't know he's filming it because he's recording the audio and it's like a low angle or something like mm-hmm. that and. The attorney essentially says, so you have no control of the footage, right? And he was like, nope, none. He owns it all. I goes, well, where is it? Oh, it's in my shed. Well, does he have a copy of it? No. Does he, is he using it right now? No. Well, I think it's clear what has to happen. Yeah. And, and then it burns down. Yeah, and then yeah. it magically burns down as Joe is walking back to his car saying what you said. It's like, I think I think someone out here could use $10,000 or something like oh, that. Oh, so the 10000 that was in relation to burning Was down. to hire an arsonist to okay. burn down. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So Joe does have a history of hiring people to do illegal things. Sure. Yeah. And it turns out, um, I don't remember all the beats as far as how the cops eventually got involved. Like, were the police involved? I think Carol had reported some of the threats so they knew there was some yeah, kind of threat. The police were already investigating him for other things. <laughs> so, th- like, during the, the misuse of campaign funds and sourcing from your business into that, and then... Was s- it maybe some big cat Yeah, selling or, I don't know, uh, cat cubs across state lines and things like that where you're not supposed to. The unlawful euthanization of... I, just, I said that wrong. Of cats well, and alleged that's by... They allege that Doc Antle does that. That, yeah, that he that he just breeds the cubs and then kills the cubs as soon yeah. as they're not profitable. But there's all these charges that are building against Joe Exotic, which is why the feds are watching him. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but at that time, then he, uh, well, he gets arrested. I, I just don't remember. So yeah. So one of the Las Vegas guys uh, who was brought on when he first came onto the scene. Guy done prison time in the past, kind of looked like a pretty rough dude. Oh, yeah, that guy, the bald guy. Yeah. yeah. He was the one who took the $3,000 and said, I'll drive down to Florida right now and I'll do it. And according to him, that was the deal. That's why he was paid the $3,000 and that was his mission. But he says his intention was yeah. to just steal the money and leave. Well, well I, mean, I mean, that's what he, that's, that, we, that's his no, story. He after did the, say that, but then he followed up by saying, I go down and kill her for nothing. Oh, he did say that? Yeah, so, and then he fi- he says l- what was lucky for him is that he chickened out halfway there. Oh. So he was going to do it, then he chickened out and just went to South Carolina, went back home and kept the money. Oh, okay. For some reason, I thought in my head that he had said something about, like, I just wanted to get one, just get all this money and just ditch out and just leave yeah. them. I thought he said something like that. And he said, he uh. said contradictory things. Yeah, okay. Um, but, uh... Cops get involved. He gets arrested. And um, I don't remember if there's trial in this show or not. When you, when you say he gets arrested, you mean Joe Exotic? Exotic. Yeah. yeah, yeah not, he ends not, up not the hitman. So long story short, he gets he's in jail as we start the show. He's yeah. in jail. He doesn't seem to be doing well in there. No, he's um, freaking out. Yeah, he doesn't seem like a, a great place for anybody, let alone this, this, this odd fellow. So uh, 
that's basically how it ends. I mean, they do some kind of like where people end up. Yeah, I um, mean, he's they they get him for unlawful killing of tigers. They find like five tiger skulls. They, well, and the hiring someone to kill. Yeah, and they, and yeah. for the Carol Baskin yeah. murder plot. Right. And he gets twenty two years. I think yeah. it was twenty two years. He's in his fifties, probably late. Yeah, he was fifty five at the so, time, I think. That's, so that's 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 your life. That's pretty rough. Yeah. Um, and. Uh, yeah, so now he's in jail and or prison. And did you hear in the news today that the the police are now reporting that they're getting at least six somewhat credible leads on the Don Lewis murder? Oh, really? Since this came out. You know, that happens where uh, Cold a, cases. a show becomes a big hit and then it just sort of wakes up some of the threads out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and this is people really, I mean, in my observations on Twitter, I guess, and uh, people seem to be, I see constant references to Tiger King and that, yeah. so... The show is uh, everybody's talking about it and watching it, and mm-hmm. um, it's uh, weird. And I, I also could understand why it might provoke different reactions in different people. Some people might think Joe is a victim here, or some people might think he's a, a monster. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I personally think he's he's predatory, and a bro- they're all the mostly are broken people taking. Ad- most of the show is basically broken people taking advantage of other broken people, kind of mm-hmm. uh, having a great time doing it though. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, parts of the story are sympathetic, parts that are pretty reprehensible. The cat, the animal abuse is pretty gross. Um, so, well, yeah. I mean, you, it's very weird. You never see outward animal abuse in terms wow. of like someone when they're hitting, taking, separating the babies from the mother. That was pretty outward, wasn't it? As a be- I mean, they're she's I mean, she's, veterinarians do that for certain reasons too. I sure. mean, that's. I wouldn't call the act of doing that abuse, but right. the act of simply breeding them for the purposes of selling them. I mean, that that's a tough one, too. Yeah. I don't personally like it. I would never do it to another animal, but there's people all over the country who do it with other species. of. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. I would say it's probably abuse, in my opinion, to take an animal from its mother. I understand there's medical clinical reasons at certain situations. This is not that. Um, but the, you know, they kill some animals. I mean, they don't show them killing animals. People but you're talking about the scene where they drag the, the baby away with the stick yeah, the whole time. Yeah. They're on the other side of a fence yeah. uh, in the, this, this, this pregnant <laughs> And Joe tiger. was like, zoom in on her butt. There's another one coming. Get up <laughs> on her <get> butt. <laughs> yeah. And like him like this, I can get hundred thousand dollars from this thing. Like, right. Is it exactly abuse in that? I don't know, but they're abusing. I mean, this is kind of captivity. For an animal that they say needs 400 square miles to feel okay. Mm-hmm. And they're at best, none, none of them are in, in, you know, they're kept in small cages and, I just or even, even a larger enclosure, still nothing like mm-hmm. the animals need. That said, you can make a case for why uh, animals in the, um, in the, uh, they can't survive in the wild and they exist. So they should have some sort of refuge to, to live out mm-hmm. their, their years. I worked in the aquarium business and people would suggest that that's like imprisoning animals too. And I'm like, yeah, I know, they got fish brains. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you can make the education. They, they, him and Doc Antle would make the case that it's about education. Oh, it's yeah. a great way for people, especially defending cub petting. This is a way for people to be inspired to save the rainforest and save the different, you know, environmental ecosystems around the world where these animals mm-hmm. live. And so we educating with them. And people generally, I think, disagree that it's proper to do that to those little cubs. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, I think it's wrong, but uh, it's an interesting show, though. Well done, uh, well done show. I was going to say something about the uh, one of the weirdest scenes where there's the tornado. Oh, yeah, it just happens to be a tornado. <laughs> a of, fucking huge. Like the, the finger of God tearing yeah. the, the <laughs> earth apart. It's like a Coen Brothers movie. Yeah. And there's just be- a really amazing tornado, too. I My dad saw like a little squiggly tornado once in Illinois. Mm-hmm. But like this is a big fucking yeah. like, like like computer. It looks like a computer created it. Like with you can see the stuff flinging around mm-hmm. at the bottom of it, and so they're not that far. And Joe's standing there yelling around, yelling, saying stuff about that's a tornado. You gotta get it. <laughs> then he jumps on an ATV and, and it's raining, and he's driving off without a helmet and the fucking tor- like, like kind of driving towards the tornado. <laughs> it's just like what the fuck, man. <laughs> can you do the rest of this in that voice? <laughs> I tell you what, he got the his tornado coming in that. He's got to be real careful. Don't forget to lock and bend the knee, everybody. 
Um, <laughs> there's just so many bizarre moments. It's really hard to look away. It's, it I is love like, the jet ski scene, which is all of a sudden, bah! I, I forget what song it was, but you got this this giant dude in a life pervert preserver, preserver. life pervert, <laughs> in a life pervert. <laughs> yes, uh, with the, yeah, in a life preserver. Yes, and uh, what do you call those things you put in your you know, the water pedophiles? Water pedophiles. the floaties, <laughs> the yeah. arm floaties. What I don't remember the water water wings, water wings. Yeah, but what, what's the jet ski? scene Who's uh the guy i think his name is james i, I, I the, the the strip club, club oh guy. okay just randomly out of oh, the yeah, yeah, yeah. for no reason that. whatsoever we suddenly cut to the shot of him in the ocean driving at us in slow motion yeah looking like a total dweeb yeah. on a jet ski with this like heavy metal rock music playing in the background yes it's a weird su- shot it's like what straight is going the, on straight at the camera yeah yeah there's a lot of just strange stuff in this whole show it's amazing just how weird you can make people look through the power of editing Oh, for sure. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, yeah, no, 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 no doubt. This show or these people are so bizarre that like you wouldn't. It could only be reality. Mm-hmm. Like that truth is stranger than fiction thing. Like if you wrote it and you made a script or you had a show that was about this, I don't think you could pull it off. I don't, I don't think anybody <sighs> would buy it. It'd be like you because you, I don't think you could make them all sound like incongruously authentic the way they do because they're all weirdos, but yeah. they are in this big cat. What is it about big cats? Do you have any, did you have any thought about that at all? Like no, we're doing like animal rehabilitation. We never had large cats. Yeah. But the people that I interacted with in that line of work were very, very odd people. Yeah. But I think the larger the animals get, the crazier the people get. Right. Like, I mean, like, I, I know plenty of horse people and no, oh, they'll, 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 <laughs> I do. I've known, a lot, I've, I've known a bunch of horse people. I worked at a horse barn for a summer and, um knew some horse folks they ever serve you man flesh yeah 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 horse would, people scare me they would uh chop it off of a living man and the only reason man. i say that is because i'm afraid of horses oh yeah so, i don't i don't like horses i, yeah. I respect them i think they're cool animals but yeah like, as far distance, as like having one and being near them they're dumb big expensive yeah. dangerous strong. all they do is they and they're se- they but there's i learned how to ride a horse too and they're sensitive and sweet i mean i get why people get connected to them because yeah. they're kind of cool fun to feed them a carrot and stuff, but they'll just bite your fucking nose off. Yep. Um, cars that poop. <laughs> <laughs> but the big cat thing, not only from the, okay, because there's like the exhibitors, which mm-hmm. is the Joe Exotics, the Doc Antles, the Carol Baskins. And there's, oh yeah, we forgot about the, like the, the mafia connected Italian guy who has his like secret Florida on. Remember like, it's like no, high he's... security. Um, yeah. I, I don't remember what the hell that was about so many weird characters in this so those are the exhibitors and then there's like the collectors that are just like like instead of getting a dog or a cat or a fish you get uh, a a big cat a fucking 400 pound predator that you keep in a cage in your backyard or sign of power and authority yeah it's just shaquille o'neal is like oh god no i got two cats i went uh, met this guy joe exotic he's got two cats um so like, yeah, there's, it's like a luxury good as a status symbol, but mm-hmm. I don't know what the, the collectors are, are, what their game, what their thing is. And then there's the people who go to the exhibitions, the zoos, these low, weird little scammy zoos, mm-hmm. and they want to be photographed with the cats. And I think maybe they get social media cachet out of it. That's they mm-hmm. sort of reference that to have like mm-hmm. a, a Twitter or a Tinder trend where people want to, are dating. They want to have a photo of them with a the cat. Yeah. The, the, I don't know. I've never been. I think I would. I mean, they're char- like you, you heard the uh, phrase um, charismatic megafauna. Mm-hmm. It's a cool term. It, it's a, it's a like, I don't know if it's scientific, but it's used to describe like the mastodons, the elephants, the mammoths, the big rhinoceroses, all the all the huge sort of plains animals. I think I think buffalo are considered charismatic me- megafauna. I think the cats are too. like the just the huge animals like the the dinosaurs, like so to speak, like the dinosaurs of the mammals. <laughs> Okay. Like the ones that roam around and like the big oh, cool. Did, are you saying mm. mega fauna? Yeah, mega. Fauna. Oh, I heard that. Okay, that I think makes... I said mega man fauna. I, I was hearing megafauna. I was like, are they, are they oh. very loud? Oh, like they have a big yeah. No, yeah, no, 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 no. F A U N A mega fauna. That makes perfect mega sense. Yeah. So, um, I'm not sure if cats qualify exactly as that, but maybe Zacchaeus. We don't. We have a, a viewer that's a veterinarian. If he's listening, I haven't seen him commenting yet on the no. Westworld stuff, but. Uh, he would weigh in on animal issues. So, <laughs> but uh, 
what is it about wanting to be near a cat? I, I've been to the zoo and seen the, the, the lions and stuff and been like, man, that's pretty fucking, those are really like, they do have a charisma about mm-hmm. them. And you get they're a predator. They're amazing. They're powerful. They're lazy. They look, they, they, they nap. They're loud. They're fast. They have all these, uh, maybe they, they connect to a part of the human psyche that goes back to our, our deep African origins where we were prey where we had to be on lookout for big animals that might hurt us. Is I think we all kind of still have fear uh, triggers in us related to animals and stuff. So there's probably some sort of like um, spiritual in a, in a naturalistic sense, but like a, we evolved being in a world where we weren't always in charge, you know, mm-hmm. our instincts are probably set up in some way to react to animals in that sense. Animals are very connected to each other too. We, I, I saw a video, uh, this morning of a, a bird, like a crane, standing on the back of a, cro- of a crocodile or an alligator. And it was yeah. moving through the water. Oh, it yeah, looked like they, the they do that a lot. Unlikely animal pairings is always a delight. Mm-hmm. And um, like you and I, we're an unlikely animal pairing. Mm-hmm. But do you have any thoughts about why cats particularly pull people in in this kind of almost, I guess, spiritual way? I don't know. You know what I mean? Like there's a power there that's sort of very has a kind of a gravity to it that i think affects seems to affect other people stronger than me but i I still kind of get it yes (laughs) no i i read something and i don't know how valid this is but it was a a bizarre article that said something like cats give off some sort of chemical that affects human brain chemistry whoa and we're talking house cats oh so maybe if that's true, if, if a person were to spend enough time around giant cats, maybe they would go crazy faster. Uh, yeah, a, a stronger, more potent yeah. brain chemical. You're not talking about the cat poop parasite that no. pregnant women have to avoid or something. No, no. This, yeah. And again, the article could have been total bullcrap, which it probably was. Yeah. Well, who knows? Um, cats versus dogs. They, they do have a... I, I watched this documentary about cats... And they do have a wildness. They, they they do seem to be like like a little part of their mind is connected to some other universe. Like dogs are in our reality fully. Dogs and humans are pretty much yeah. the same sort of animal. Oh, cats? Are- we like to touch each other. We like to sniff stuff. We're gross. We poo. We eat. Cats do some of that. But cats have their own agenda. Right. That I don't know if they understand. <laughs> yeah, you, you can sit down, have a cat walk up to you and sit in your lap and insist that you pet it for like two hours straight. And then you can go and, and hand prepare food for it, serve it to it in a crystal dish, watch it sit there and eat. And then five minutes later, it'll still walk by and swat you in the face and draw blood <laughs> because they're a-holes. <laughs> I like picturing you getting cut by a cat. Sorry. I have been uh, hit by cats so many times for nothing. No reason. Unprovoked. Really? Not because you were threatening to frame them for murder? Yes. Put snakes in their cat box? Yeah. But, um, yeah. I, I got attacked by a cat. I mean, we had we grew up with cats. We always had cats. I got all kinds of nutty cat stories. But my mom's cat died. And of course, she was all fucking upset and shit. And so I decided to find another cat for her. And mm-hmm. I got one. It was a lady. Her husband was in Iraq. This was like in the 2000s. And she was moving and she just couldn't keep the cat anymore. And I was like, great, I'm helping this lady out. You know, I paid, I think I paid her a little bit and the cat seemed cool. But as soon as we got the cat inside, my mom had already had another cat. So we had that cat in a bad bedroom. And this fucking thing went cat shit. I almost said ape shit, but it mm. wouldn't be appropriate. And it attacked both of us and we were running away from it. Like I knew if I had to, I would beat up the cat. I think if I really had to, a over 200 pound man who does push ups every other week could probably beat up a cat. But I don't want to have to kill a cat. By the way, I think I would get scratched pretty badly in the process, probably bitten, and it would be a very emotionally disturbing thing for me to go through. And I try to protect my emotions because I'm a bit of a nut, a little bit too sensitive. <laughs> and <laughs> so you run from the cat and you feel this prey, you feel this fear. And we would go into my mom's kitchen. Which is like now we're cornered. It's like a cul-de-sac. You know, there's like one way in and one way out. And the cat comes in. And I remember like lifting my body up onto the counter, like with both hands. They're like, oh, fuck at this cat. <laughs> so I, I, what the hell did we do with that cat? It's terrifying being attacked. And this is a 10 pound fucking cat. Mm-hmm. And it was freaked out. The cat was upset. The cat had a bad day. I mean, the cat has been, you know, kidnapped from its home. And <laughs> it was so horrible. Uh, 
so being attacked by a monster cat by a 400 pound oh, yeah. 500 600 pound cat there's just i couldn't even imagine no. and people keep like these little weird cats that are like 12 like that are like 15 20 pounders oh yeah, yeah. i've seen those, those big scary ones anyway anything you want to say uh no i i i think the show is worth watching all right i think it's interesting i think Great. it's uh definitely i don't know i'm running out of words that's fine you don't have to have it all figured out um i uh, appreciated it and i uh, hope others do too we we would say that we give it the james and hank seal of approval yep the roar of want to do some cat roars while we say goodbye uh, i will defer roar. no you do one yeah uh, yo that's, that's good yeah, yeah. can you do a meow maybe just say it meow there you go <laughs> i did it <laughs> All right, everybody. Thanks for uh, listening, watching. I hope the cat drawing t- works out well. As of now, as we're recording the audio, I have not finished drawing it. So, honestly, I have no clue if it's going to work out. Probably going to end up looking ridiculous. Um, that's all we got. James, been a, it's been swell. Mm-hmm. Time for some meat. Oh, yeah. And some cat food. And uh, if this coronavirus thing keeps going, we're all going to be eating cat food or become cat food, I guess. So, what do you got? You going to play something on your phone there? Oh, no, no. Oh, all right. Sorry. I thought you were getting queuing up like a sound. No, just trying to make it not make too much more noise. You're doing great. Um, Goodbye, everybody. See ya. Rawr. Rawr. That went long, of course.